morning, good morning. Hey, everyone out in the lobby. So good to see you all out there. You're starting to make your way in. Welcome to those of you joining us online. You have picked an incredible Sunday to join us. We have so much going on. I'm going to let you know in just a moment. Um, but before we do, if you are new, then extra special welcome to you. If this is your first time or maybe your second, third time somewhere in there, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And um, we would love to help welcome you here and get to know you a little bit. And you can help us do that by just simply pulling out your phones right now. If you're new and texting the word welcome, that's all you got to do. One word. It doesn't matter if it's uppercase or lowercase. Just welcome to 724-414-2585. It's that simple. And then in a minute or so, you're going to get a text back from us with a little link. Click on that link. Let us know your name, just a little bit about you. And then after the service, we're going to have a gift ready for you right out at that table in the lobby. Our volunteers can meet you there and answer any questions you might have about the church or this morning in general as you're picking up that gift. But again, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. We hope you have a great experience. And that's something you experienced this morning, if you're new, would lead you into a growing relationship with Jesus because that's what this church is all about. And it's not just on Sundays. We have an event coming up that you're all invited to, first timers, long timers. It's coming up on Saturday, April 13th. So we're giving you a little bit of a heads up, but the reason is we're going to have like 40,000 meals that we have to package that day. So we're going to need well over a hundred of you to volunteer some of your time to help us do that. Through your generosity, we purchase every year a bunch of like rice and beans and vitamin packs and stuff like that. Um, but then we package them here on a Saturday morning, April 13th, into about 40,000 meals. In fact, last year we did 35,000 meals. We're going for 5,000 more, okay? And so you can help us do that by just going to today's link, scanning that QR code in front of you and just registering. You can register for the whole morning from 9 a.m. until noon or an hour and a half shift. If you want to come as a family, a small group, uh, and you're like, hey, I can do an hour and a half that Saturday morning, that's great. Register for 9 to 9, or 9.30, that would only be a half an hour. 9 to 10.30 or 10.30. 30 to 11, or like I said, the whole morning, but please come be a part of it. There'll be well over a hundred of us. Um, great opportunity for individuals, families, small groups, an excellent opportunity to invite that friend who's maybe not sure about God, not sure about church, but they're all about doing something good. This Saturday morning, we're doing a whole lot of good. So make an invite. They're going to get introduced to a whole bunch of cool people. It's such a fun event. So uh, we look forward to seeing you there. As far as this morning, we're going to be together for uh, just over an hour. Today is just going to be amazing. I'm just letting you know up front. We're continuing a series that we kicked off last week called Ecclesia. What is that word about? Well, it's Greek and it has everything to do with followers of Jesus. So we're going to let you know more about that. Um, we're going to hear from two of our very own that are getting baptized second service, but you're going to get to hear their stories and their public profession of faith. So we've got Jackie and Jeremy um, that you're going to hear their stories from. But before we get to any of that, we're going to sing some songs, some of our favorites this morning that are just all about the hope and the way of following Jesus and the life that is found in and through him. So why don't you stand, give a wave and a smile to someone around you, welcome them here. And I'm gonna hand it off to the band. Good morning, everybody. We got a celebration this morning. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb yeah. Till I made you I was breathing I was breathing Oh 
where our stories meet, right here in the middle. I need a rescue. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven.
nothing at all He is so great and probably the one of the greatest things um, that we get to ever experience in our life and, and witness is someone's life being absolutely changed in and through the resurrected Jesus. And so second service, we're going to have two individuals, Jeremy and Jackie, that are going to take the step to publicly profess their faith and get baptized. Um, but their stories uh, are ready for you to hear during this service. Uh, and we want you to hear them, one, because you're a part of them. If you're a part of this church, you're a part of these stories and what Jesus is doing. Um, but we just want you to hear them because they're so inspirational and they're an act of worship for us all to give praise to God for all that he has done and is doing in their lives and in each and every one of our lives. So why don't you take a seat and um, baptism, if you're brand new this morning, uh, just simply is a public declaration of faith, okay? And then it's paired with an outward demonstration of an inward transformation. And so you're going to hear their public declaration. And then during second service, they're going to get baptized. And that outward demonstration of baptism is just symbolically demonstrating what Christ has done in their life. So when they go under the water, they're symbolically demonstrating that, hey, my past is my past. We all have a past. Past. Their past is their past. And when they come out of the water, they're symbolically demonstrating that my life is now new. You've heard this term born again. My life is now new. That's what Jesus has done in my life. Through his resurrection, I can now experience resurrected life by following in his way. So that's what baptism is all about. And uh, man, just check out these stories. Incredible. Hi, my name's Jeremy. Jeremy. And this is my story. Growing up was like many other people. Uh, I was raised in the church. Um, at a young age, I uh, tended to get into a bit of trouble. As I started getting a little bit older, I started to pull back. Uh, tried to not go, tried to make excuses, didn't feel good. Tried to always resist going to church felt very awkward never felt at place at church where we were going at the time always felt like i was an outcast never accepted uh, so i pretty much quit going in fact the only time i really ever went to church uh, was on mother's day christmas and easter because those were the days that meant the most to my mom and my grandparents after that i left and went to college and I never went to church. All I ever really did was overindulge in alcohol, substance abuse, never living the life of what a Christian was supposed to live. Eventually uh, graduated college, moved on to that next step of marriage with my college sweetheart at the time. A couple years later, we had our first child. Still living that same party in life. Definitely put a strain on my relationship with my wife. My kids were young, so they didn't really notice it. But I knew that eventually it would end up playing a toll on them. Um, because it played a toll on me, I actually grew up in a home with the father who had substance abuse. Having conversations with my mom all the while, saying... You know, I'm happy, but something's missing. Something's just not clicking. Never understood why until I started getting a little bit older. And I met one of my neighbors and we were talking to one day. You know, he's like, did you ever try going to church? I said, yeah, I've been, I've been to church before, but it, it's really never been for me. He mentioned to me potentially having a sit down conversation, just a easy cup of coffee with one of the guys at the church, Pastor James. So first time we met, went in, big smile, very welcoming. Okay, not used to that. So sat down and started talking and I, you know, just easy conversations, just talking about the day and how life's going. And not once did I feel he was judging me in any way. He just was listening. I decided that I was going to start attending this church. 
everybody's very welcoming, saying hi, how are you, good morning, no judgment. I, I felt great. Never felt like that walking into a church in my entire life. So I went in, found a seat in the back, and started listening, listening to the message, listening to the songs. Fast forward, maybe a couple weeks later, decided to come again. Same thing, great feeling, good emotions, left feeling very whole, happy, not used to having that feeling after leaving the church service. The message was hitting me and it was reaching my soul and I didn't understand it because it's never happened before. And all of a sudden, my family starts asking, are you going to church tomorrow? Absolutely. Well, we're going to go with you. It's a great feeling to know that they saw me doing something to better myself and the way that I'm coming home, feeling better, feeling whole, uh, not having that aggressiveness, not having that anger or ill will towards anybody, just feeling calm and contented. I've now become substance free, alcohol free, feeling great about myself. He's actually showing me how real he is and following in his path can really set you up for life because I feel like I'm a completely different person than I was a year ago or two years ago. I truly believe God put these people in my life for a reason. From my neighbor, Brian, to Pastor Jane, to the guest speakers and the people from the church that just welcome you and make you feel at home. For 43 years, I've tried things my way. I've tried to push people away, God included. Through all the pain and suffering I put myself, family and friends through, I have never been more certain of wanting to do anything in my life than get baptized and give my life to Christ as my Lord and Savior. Pennsylvania for about 26 years now. I'd say that my childhood was uh, rough, but it was probably my own doing. I brought a lot of things on myself because I misbehaved a lot. I tended to live a life of sin. As a teenager, I acted out a lot. Um, didn't make things easy for my parents. As a young adult, I went to prison. Um, made poor choices and um, I realized that I couldn't always lead my own path that I needed somebody else in my life and uh, that's when I was saved relationships have always been hard for me um, and I think that having Jesus in my life meeting Jesus uh, opened that door for me to have a better relationship and uh not only with myself, but with others. And he allowed me to meet my fiance, Clayton. Clayton's had a lot of heart issues. He has uh, congenital heart failure. And although we have had a rough um, path, he has guided us in, and given us many blessings. Clayton is doing wonderful. His, his health is going uphill, not downhill. And I have only Jesus to thank for that. Within a few months of one of Clayton's most serious incidents, um, last year uh, in September, uh, Clayton AFibbed. And it was terrifying. And uh, in October after that, his friend Richard Cahall invited me to come to church with him here at Northbridge. So I started coming, He and I picked him up, and I drove him to church with me, and, um, and I used to sit in the back, and I didn't talk to anybody, because I didn't know anybody. 
it was a few months before I actually started to mix and mingle. And uh, I did starting point the first time. Uh, I jumped into it halfway through. And uh, Krista and Scott have been amazing. Uh, I really like them. They've really impacted me. And the group has really impacted my life. On top of starting point, I am also in a small group uh, with Kristen DeMarco and some other awesome people who are starting to become like family to me. Uh, they have really welcomed me into their group and I am really enjoying myself being there. I wouldn't have kept going if it wasn't for Kristen. She's been awesome and uh, they have been awesome. So I wanted to thank Kristen and Scott and Krista um, for they've made a bit big impact in my journey here at uh, Northbridge. So my name's Jackie and I'm here to be baptized today and let everyone know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I mean, that, that's what it's all about. I mean, it is. We could stop right there this morning. I say that every time because it's true. We could. That's all we need is to celebrate what Jesus has done and is doing in people's lives. And for those of us that have already placed our faith and trust in Jesus and taken that step of baptism, um, we just get to look back and remember and give thanks once again um, that Jesus is alive and changing lives. And just like that song we opened up with this morning, people are running out of the grave of addiction and bondage and bad choices and experiencing new life in and through Jesus. And um, one of the things that just really impacted me in both of those stories, other than what Jesus has done, is both of their stories and their path to Jesus started just with a simple invite. Did you catch that? Just a friend saying, you should check this out or you should go here, come and sit with me. And they trusted God with the rest and God, like he has with so many of us, just met, met us in that step of faith. Maybe it was a camp for you way back. Maybe it was a different church. Maybe it was this one that has just been continually growing in their relationship with Jesus. So for those of you that have invited, um, you're, you're the result of an invite. Those of you that are always questioning, should I make that invite? I hope that it would just further encourage us to know that it is always, always worth it. Just like the original followers of Jesus. They're like, come and see. Just, just come and see. I can't explain it. Just come and see. It can be that simple. Come and see. Come sit with me. And God will meet you in that place. He is just so good from our minor efforts. And what a humbling experience to just be used by him through a simple invite. I pray that we would all experience that many times throughout our lives. Let's just give thanks. Father, I thank you for life change. And the stories that we just heard, um, they're both in starting point right now. You're continuing to just pour into their lives and transform them from the inside out. And I just, I pray for the step uh, of baptism that's going to happen for each of them during our second service. I pray for the family members and friends that they've invited to be a part of it. Um, that they would just be receptive to those stories and that you would use these stories to break through walls of pain and doubt and questions and that your love and your light would break through for each and every one of them. The second greatest story that we could ever hear or tell is the story that, that you're telling in and through us and how we're being changed by you. So we just pray for those stories uh, today and beyond as they're shared and each and every one of our stories of what you're doing in our lives. We just thank you. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and the life, the life here and now and the life eternal that's found in and through him. We pray these things in his name and everybody said, amen. We're going to continue to worship right now by receiving the morning's offering. Instructions are going to be up on the screen on how you can be a part of that. There's also a drop box at the back of the room. Um, if you're here in the house online, you're going to get a pop-up for today's links. And as we take time to give, we're going to be syncing up with our partner churches as Andy continues our current series, Ecclesia. Living on Earth might make you feel small. You're just one of eight billion on this blue cosmic ball. So many characters with their roles to play. 
perhaps many, if not most, still finding their way. Some who are given to athletic pursuits, while others find joy on educational routes. Those who build and those who farm. Those who sell widgets using their charm. But aren't we more than what we do? Being one of eight billion should give us a clue. On our own, it's difficult to make a big dent. Brokenness and need refuse to relent. Perhaps we were designed for a much grander endeavor. Not toiling alone, but pulling together. The planet is large. This much is true. But when God calls his people, there's so much we can do. Solve the world's problems. That does sound absurd. But maybe we can start with this strange little word. So um, here's something that more and more Americans are doing um, for entertainment. Um, predict outcomes for money, a.k.a. gambling. But I just thought this was such a heavy word to start the sermon with, so we're just going to go with predict outcomes for money. <clears throat> In fact, just show of hands, how many of you predicted outcomes for money on the Super Bowl? Just kidding. Don't raise your hand. Okay. <clears throat> Now, for the most part, predicting outcomes for money is kind of a harmless pastime. Um, For others, though, it's a very harmful pathway. And um, I I, I don't know, I think wisdom says you don't know until you start. And then once you start, you realize, "Uh uh-oh, it's not the same for me as it is for everybody else. And maybe it's just not wise to start. Um, So I don't mean to make light of that. But the reason I even bring it up, other than just to get your attention, is this. And this is pretty amazing. This may be new for for some of you, I don't know, Jesus actually predicted some outcomes, but not for money. In fact, nobody, and I mean nobody, would have put any money on any of his predictions because they were really, really bad odds. Then again, they were God odds. I don't know if God odds is actually a thing, but anyway, since he claimed to be the son of God, they were pretty good odds. But in the moment when Jesus began predicting things, nobody would have put any money on any of his predictions. They were just crazy. But as it turns out, all but a couple actually came to pass, which should lead us to believe that perhaps the ones that have not yet come to pass will in fact eventually come to, pa- to pass. Now, my favorite um, prediction made by Jesus, in fact, you know, a lot of people use the word prophecy, so we can use that. The, you know, the, my favorite prophecy in, in the New Testament or early in the whole Bible, but specifically my favorite Jesus prophecy, my favorite Jesus prediction about the future is actually us, the church, or the word he uses is ecclesia. In fact, as we talked about last time, as we began this series, standing in the middle of literally nowhere, surrounded by a bunch of nobodies, at least culturally speaking, they were a bunch of nobodies. Um, Jesus asked them, if you'll remember, he said, hey, guys, what's the word on the street about me? What are people saying about me? Which is not a safe question for most of us to ask, unless you want to get your feelings hurt, okay? So I don't recommend the question. But Jesus is like, hey, what are, what are people saying about me? And if you'll remember, Peter answered correctly. Peter said, well, I'll tell you who I think you are. Um, I, you know, the we can tell you what everybody else thinks, but Jesus said, but yeah, but what do you think of who, who do you think I am? And Peter says, I'll tell you who I think you are. I think you're actually the king. I think you're God's final king. His word was, I think you're Messiah, the king. I think you're actually the son of God. And Jesus replied to Peter and the guys, yes, that is exactly who I am. And then he looks at Peter and he says, now let me tell you who you are. And I tell you that you are Peter, and the Greek word is like a rock, a little stone. He renames him, basically he renames him Rocky or literally Stony or Pebbly. I, that Pebbly is not a, a, a great word, nickname for a man. But anyway, so he says, I'm giving you a new name. And then he says this, and on this rock, and he uses a different Greek word. He uses the word Petra, which is like a huge outcropping of rock, the side of a mountain. And he's referencing Peter's answer to the question of who do, you, who do you think I am? When Peter said, I think you're the Christ and the son of the living God. Jesus is saying, you're exactly right. And on that foundation, on that outcropping of immovable mountainside, on that foundation, that Petra, that bedrock, that massive rock foundation, I will build my ecclesia. My assembly, 
My people, my people with a purpose, my people who will be a movement, people who will gather in my name to execute my mission. And guys, just in case you're wondering, because they're looking at each other like, is he crazy? Have we been out in the sun too long? What are you, he's talking about a new movement. He said, and my death or the gates of Hades, talking about his own death or death in general, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In other words, he's saying, guys, even when I die, that's not the end of my movement. Even once I'm gone, my movement goes on. And not only was his death not the end, I mean, here we are. His death and resurrection actually launched the movement. Now, again, because of where we are and where we live, it's hard for us to get our minds around this and emotions around this. This was crazy talk. In fact, it's not just crazy, it's dangerous. <clears throat> Pitting himself against the religious establishment and the Roman Empire, which is exactly what he was doing. Because Rome, Rome did not like new movements. Every 50 years or so in that region of the world, some crazy person would come along and claim to be a Messiah and gather a following. And Rome would have to execute hundreds of people to quell that rebellion. There was always somebody claiming to be a Messiah. And here's Jesus standing out there in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by these guys basically saying, it's going to happen again, but this time it's for Real Again, pitting himself against the religious establishment and the Roman Empire, no way. Way. It happened. Here we are. My favorite Jesus prediction. Us. Today we're in part two of a series. We've called ecclesia, the word Jesus used to describe, the Greek term Jesus used to describe his movement. And the word ecclesia, that's what it means. It means an assembly that comes together to accomplish something. And the reason we're doing this series is we're taking a look back to ensure that we as a local church and we as a network of local churches stay on track. Because while expressions of the Christian faith vary from generation to generation, culture to culture, the way we baptize changes, the way we sing changes, where we gather, what the buildings look like, all of those things change. There is a core that never, ever changes. Jesus' original intent for his assembly, for his movement has not changed. And we can't afford to lose sight of that, of, of that original idea of his original charge to his original first century followers. If we veer away from that, we get into trouble and we misrepresent Jesus to the world. Because here's what we all know from either personal history or just knowing a little bit of church history. When the church veers, things get weird, right? I mean, when the church veers away from Jesus' original intent, things get weird. When the church or a local church loses its way, people get hurt. Abuse with a divine excuse. People get hurt in Jesus' name. And God's name gets stamped on behaviors that God finds despicable. And there's always a chapter and a verse. There's always a chapter and a verse to support that despicable behavior. But then along comes, as we talked about last time, someone always comes along or a group always comes along and says, not on our watch. That was not Jesus' original intent. And we're calling the church back to what Jesus originally had in mind when he launched his assembly, his ecclesia. Now, why is this important? And why is it important for us to talk about it for a few weeks? And here's why. Because in our communities, whatever church you're in, in your communities, we are stewards of, or maybe a better word is, we are responsible for the church in our generation. And we're responsible for what the next generation thinks about when they think about church. Think about it. You're a Christian. If you're a Christian, when you're in the marketplace, when you're at work, or when you're at home, when you're at school, wherever you are, if you're a Christian, you represent what Christianity is. And you, we can say all day long that Christianity is the following truths all written out, but in terms of reality and in terms of people's experience, you are, I am what Christianity is. We determine what people think about when they think about Christianity, when they think about the church. And if we are not in sync with Jesus' original intent, we mislead people because we misrepresent our King, we determine what Christianity looks like, acts like, and reacts like. So we are looking back to ensure that we as a local church and as a group of local churches stay on track. Any questions so far? 
Good. Now, today we're jumping right into the narrative. This is exactly what happened. We're going to walk for the next few weeks through the storyline of the first church. Fortunately, a doctor named Luke, who actually wrote the gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, also documented the first few years of the church after the resurrection. Now, as I remind you at Easter, every Easter I remind you of this, that nobody anticipated, this is so important for the storyline, nobody anticipated Jesus rising from the dead. Nobody. They buried him as if he was going to do what dead people always do, which is stay dead. In fact, at Easter, I always do this little fill in the blank game with you. Let's see if we can do it even though it's not Easter. Every Easter, I say this, nobody expected Nobody, that's exactly right. Five people paying attention, it's encouraging. <clears throat> that's right. Nobody expected nobody when they came to the grave. They expected Jesus to stay dead because that's what dead people do. So the resurrection took them by surprise. But the resurrection wasn't the only thing they didn't expect. Five weeks after Jesus rose from the dead, after he had appeared to hundreds of of people, according to the Apostle Paul in his letter to Christians living in Corinth, one of the earliest Christian documents in existence, he said hundreds of people saw the resurrected Jesus. So about five weeks after his resurrection, he gathers his followers together, several hundred people, and he gives them kind of a farewell address. And as part of that farewell address, there's a very short Q&A. In fact, we only know of one question they ask, and here was their question. They're standing in front of the resurrected Jesus and they say, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, we've been praying for a Messiah that would restore our national identity and our national independence. And is this the time when you're gonna proclaim yourself a national king? Like in the days of David and in the days of Solomon when we had our independence? I mean, surely that's what's next. But that was not what was next. We were next. Ecclesia was next, but they didn't see it coming. So Jesus replied, it is not for you to know that he didn't make fun of their question. He just kind of avoided the question. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority. It's kind of a dodge. It's like, you know what? That's not gonna happen now. It may happen later. And then he changes the subject. And then he says, let me tell you what it is time for. And he looks at this group of men and women whose hearts had been shattered and broken when he died. And now they're in the presence of a resurrected rabbi. And he says, let me tell you what's gonna happen. It's gonna be bigger. It's gonna be better. It's not gonna be focused on a piece of geography. It's not gonna be about a nation. It's gonna be for every nation. He says, here's what's gonna happen. You are gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. In the old covenant, under the old covenant, or if we read the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would kind of drop in on people and leave, drop in on people and leave, drop in on people and leave. Jesus says that day has come to an end. The Holy Spirit is going to drop in on all of you and stay. And when it does, you're going to receive power. <laughs> and of course they're thinking, yes, power. And what are we going to do with our power? We're going to expel the Romans, right? That's what we're going to do with our power. Jesus smiles and says, no, you're gonna, the Holy Spirit's gonna come on you and with his power, you're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, just to make sure you understand the geography. Jerusalem's the city, Judea's the region. He said, you're gonna be my witnesses in the city of Jerusalem and in the region of Judea, to which they thought witnesses. A witness is somebody who testifies in court. So we're all going to court, Jesus continues, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, to which they thought, no, 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 those aren't our people. We don't even go to Samaria, Samaria. We don't even like the Samaritans. And Jesus continues and he says, and to the ends of the earth. And they're thinking, oh, that kind of witness, not like a witness in court, somebody who's gonna go out and tell people what they've witnessed, what they've seen. But Jesus, come on, you know, surely this is hyperbole. You don't really literally mean the ends of the earth. Like this isn't going to Egypt. I mean, this, this certainly isn't going to Rome. Hyperbole, right? But it wasn't. Jesus was serious. Again, here we are. It's why it's my favorite Jesus 
Prediction. Now, by the way, I gotta catch you up on a little cultural thing. This is really important. In our culture, we think about a bunch of different religions and people sometimes swap religions. They leave one to join the other. That was, that was unheard of in the ancient world. People didn't leave religions. There was no such thing as religions in the ancient world. There were just regions with gods and then people had household gods. And if you move from one region to the next, you would bring your household gods. You may secretly worship the God of your original region, but then eventually you would begin to worship the gods of the region you move to. This is how everybody thought in the ancient world. Everybody had their own God. You worship your God, I'll worship mine. And Rome didn't care who you worship as long as you obey Caesar. But the problem was the Jesus movement didn't work that way. The problem with the Jesus movement is that it wasn't a, you might also like. In other words, you couldn't just add Jesus to your household gods. You couldn't add Jesus to your regional gods. This was a either or proposition. Either you worship the pagan gods or you chose to worship Jesus and God and Jesus father as your one and only true God. So here's what was amazing. Jesus was sending them out into different regions of the world to convince people not to leave their religion to join a new religion. He was sending them out into the world to convince them to abandon their entire world view. That there are no gods, even though your parents thought there were and your grandparents and your great grandparents. In other words, everybody you know assumes there are many gods. Nope. There's only one God and the God you've been worshiping and the God your great grandmother that you thought was so precious, the gods that she worshiped were no gods at all. And not only is there one God, this God became a human. And this God revealed what God is like. And then this God died to pay for your sin to which non-Jewish people and people in these various regions, if they heard the word sin, they had no concept for sin. Sin was a new concept. Because the pagan gods didn't have any sins you weren't allowed to commit. The gods required sacrifice, not obedience. So this is an entirely different worldview. Everything about this was unprecedented. And obviously, as they listened to Jesus teach, they had to be thinking, this isn't going anywhere. I mean, it might work inside Judea where we have a lot of sons and daughters of Abraham who understand Torah and Yahweh and he's given us the law and there's only one God. I mean, this might, we might be able to sell this in Judea and maybe Galilee, but not Egypt, certainly not Rome. But when you've seen someone die and you visited their tomb and they're standing in front of you talking, you take them seriously. And so even though they didn't understand it, even though there's no way they could comprehend what Jesus was saying, they're like, okay, whatever you say. So he sends them back to Jerusalem. And then Luke tells us what happened next. This is amazing. The text says this. Luke says they all joined together. Now Luke knew all of these people. That's why he has all this detail. And he's about to give us extraordinary detail. In fact, one of the amazing things, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian or you've, all, you know, you've heard all kinds of stuff about the Bible. In fact, you have a strong opinion about the Bible, but if you're honest, you've never read it. But you're sure you know what it is and isn't. And I get that. There's a lot of things I have opinions about that I don't know anything about. I'm like you. I read the headlines of a story and I think I'm educated and I start talking about it. Somebody's like, did you read the article? No, I read the headline. I'm, I'm fully informed. Okay, so we, we all do that. I get that. Luke, if you, you should read the gospel of Luke. It has so much detail and you can't help but think, wait a minute. I think this guy actually looked into this. This isn't just, you know, religious jabber. Anyway, here's, here's, here's what he says. He says, all these people that Jesus said, hey, you're gonna have power, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. They all joined together constantly. This wasn't like a 30 minute thing. Constantly in prayer, along with, and Luke gives us this detail because this again was unprecedented and unheard of. Luke knew if he didn't tell us this next part, we would just envision a bunch of men together because that was the culture they lived in. Luke's like, no, I, gotta, I hate to break it to you guys. The world was changing as a result of the teaching of Jesus. They were constantly in prayer along with the women. Wait, wait, men and women praying in the same room, same area, yeah. And Mary, the mother of Jesus was there along with Jesus' brothers. <laughs> his brothers? I didn't even know Jesus had brothers. Where have his brothers been? When you read the gospels, his brothers actually thought, well, 
his brothers actually question Jesus' sanity. But again, before you're too critical, if, you're, if your older brother decided he was God's you know, gift to humanity or the Messiah, you'd think your brother lost his mind as well. They just thought Jesus was kind of crazy. But here they are praying, waiting for Jesus to fulfill this promise. What happened? What changed their mind? Not his teaching, his resurrection. The brothers are there along, along with the brothers. Um, two weeks later, so they pray day after day after day, they're praying. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem and wait. And they're like, how long do we have to wait? And then it happened. About two weeks later, about two weeks later, they're meeting together and it's a festival day in Jerusalem. It's called the day of Pentecost. It's a Pentecost celebration. Pentecost celebration, all the Judean men, not, excuse me, not Judean, all the sons of Abraham, regardless if they were from Judea or not. Basically, we would say all the Jewish men were supposed to leave whatever region of the world they lived in and come back to Jerusalem for this feast day. So on the day of Pentecost, the city of Jerusalem is packed and it's packed with men and some women and some families from all over the empire. These are sons and daughters of Abraham, but they have been dispersed into different parts of the world, but they're returning to the homeland. They're returning to Jerusalem to celebrate this sacred festival. And when on this day, while this group was praying, the Holy Spirit, in fact, exactly like Jesus predicted, fell on this group of people and gave them power. <clears throat> But a power, again, they never saw it coming. This was all so unexpected. Suddenly, they were able to understand and speak the languages of all of these primarily men who had come to the city of Jerusalem from all around the empire. Now, why in the world did God use that particular sign gift? Why in the world did God empower them to do that? And here's why. Because the arrival of Jesus and the message of Jesus was in fact good news of great joy for all people. When Jesus said, this is for the world, he was not exaggerating. It was not hyperbole. All means all and everybody means everybody. And so they go into the streets and they begin to preach and tell the story of the life and specifically the death and resurrection of Jesus. And these people from all these different regions of the empire are hearing it in the language of the region from which they've traveled. And they are shocked. They, they, this is unbelievable. Here's, Luke says, here's how they responded. Wait a minute. <clears throat> Aren't all those who are speaking, and again, we miss this, this is so important. Aren't all these who are speaking not Judeans, not Jewish, Galileans. In other words, this is the working class people from way up north. I mean, they're not even from Judea. They're not even all that cool. They're like the, they're, we can tell by their accents. They're Galileans and here they are in Jerusalem and these uneducated Galileans, they're able to speak not a different language, but the languages from, of the empire. How is it that each of us hears them in our native Language, again, how can these uneducated Galileans know our language? And then Luke, because he doesn't want to miss the detail, he actually lists the different regions of the empire from which this group came. And he just gives us the list. I'm not going to read the whole list. He says there were men there from Parthia, the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, all these different areas, Egypt, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs, over 14 different regions that he takes the time to say, there were people from all over the world, which wouldn't shock anybody because that's what happened every Pentecost celebration. But these men, primarily men, are hearing the gospel in their language from uneducated Galileans. Here's again what they said. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? mean. And Peter steps up to the mic. Well, he just stepped up. <clears throat> and he says, I'm glad you asked. And Peter preaches a message. You should read it. It's amazing. I'm just going to give you the highlights. Here's, here's kind of the gist of it. People of Israel, he says. In other words, all of you sons and daughters of Abraham, people of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth. Why of Nazareth? Because we want to make sure it's the right Jesus. These are, these are common names. This is why he had you know, a descriptor like everybody in that era. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God. In other words, God stamped his approval on him. 
to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. In other words, he didn't just claim a lot of stuff. He did a lot of stuff, which God did, here it is, among you. And this is what becomes evident when you hear this sermon, that the men and women that were sons and daughters of Abraham, even those outside the region of Judea and Galilee, had heard stories of a wonder worker, a rabbi with a different message, a a rabbi that supposedly was able to heal the sick, allow the lame to walk. And the rumor was he even healed a blind young man who had been blind from birth by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This isn't a secret. This isn't new information for you. And this man, talking about Jesus, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, he blames them, you as part of the nation, You, with the help of wicked men, probably talking about the Romans or maybe even the religious leaders in the city, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. And you could hear a pin drop. And I think he paused for effect. Then he says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because Because just as he predicted, the gates of hell will not impede my movement. Just as he predicted, because it was impossible for death, he personifies death, for death to keep its hold on him. Then later in the the same sermon, he, he says this. He says, he goes back to the resurrection. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are witnesses of the fact. They finally understand what it means to be a witness. They are the ones who witnessed the crucifixion. They are the ones who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And their job was to take what they had seen and what they had heard to all of the world. But God brought the world to them on the day of Pentecost. He continues, therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and King. The Gentiles would understand this word. Judeans and Galileans and sons and daughters of Israel understood this word. He has made him your boss. He has made him your king. God's final king has come. And Luke tells us, because Peter was there, Matthew was there, Mary, the mother of Jesus was there. There's all these witnesses to this event. You couldn't make this up. When the people heard this, when the people heard this, they were, I love this phrase, they were cut to the heart. You know what that means? That means all of their resistance evaporated. All of their pushback evaporated. Everything they've been throwing out as excuses and reasons not to believe in its rumors and you can't believe and there's no way that happened. Ever, all of their defenses just melted and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, attend church regularly. <clears throat> no, that wouldn't have made any sense. This isn't a building This isn't an event. This is a movement for the world. Peter replied, you need to believe a list of propositional truths. And we're gonna start a class this afternoon and there's 15 things you need to understand and there's sub points between, no. Because this wasn't about a what. This was about a who. He said, here's what you gotta do. Peter replied, repent. Change your mind and be baptized, every single one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. Now, this is so important. Don't don't move. Don't leave. Listen. The men, primarily men and women, in this audience were good people. These weren't wild and crazy sinners. When you think of a sinner, you're like, I'm not a sinner. I know some sinners. I'm not, they, there's not those people. The, these men and women were so devout, such great law keepers, so committed to Torah, they actually spent money to travel to Jerusalem for this festival. These are really, really good people. So why in the world does Peter say to them, you need to repent of your sin and ask God to forgive you? What, what, what sins Is he talking about it? He doesn't even know these people. What's he referring to? What sins? All of their sins. 
all of their past sins, all of the sins they thought got forgiven because they sacrificed an animal, they sacrificed a dove, they sacrificed a lamb, they sacrificed a ram, all of their sins. He said, no, 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 those days are over. The temple days and the temple ways are over. From now on, forgiveness is not found in ceremony and forgiveness is not found in your works and forgiveness is not found in your consistency and forgiveness is not found in your tenacity to obey Torah. From now on, for you and for the world, forgiveness is found in the name of Jesus, that his death on the cross as the lamb of God was the final payment for sin. He says to these good Judean and Galilean and people from all over the world people, he says, all of your sins have been forgiven, but now you must change the way you're thinking. You must leave the temple way of thinking and join the ecclesia of Jesus where you will find ultimate forgiveness for your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin because he's paid for the sins of the world. He's paid for your sin. He's paid for my sin. Paul would come along later. He had a hard time with this until he became a Jesus follower and he would write these words. These are my, my version of Paul's words. He would say, there is now no condemnation. You ever felt condemned because of something you've done to somebody else or to yourself? Broken another promise, broken a promise to yourself. There's therefore now no condemnation by God for those who are in relationship with King Jesus. This was the message on the day of Pentecost to very, very good Torah abiding, Torah obeying Judeans, Galileans, sons and daughters of Israel. It's a new day. There's a new way. There was nothing wrong with the old way, but something new has come. He says, and when you do that, you will receive, and this meant so much to this group of people, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise, and now he talks about me. And now, now Peter talks about you. This is amazing. And he, again, he couldn't anticipate any of this. He says, the promise is for you, the people in the audience, and for your children, the people who will come after you, and for all who are far off, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's us. We were, we're far off geographically. We're far off chronologically, but Peter says, I understand it now. This is good news of great joy for all people in every single generation. This is who we are. These are our people. This is our message. This is our hope. This is our future. This is what we're to reflect in our daily lives. And, and, how did the audience respond? It's amazing. And those who accepted his message were baptized, apparently that day or in the days to come. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So day one, opening day of the church, launched as Jesus intended, launched as we must keep it, an outward facing, multicultural, multiplying movement not a church service, not a list of theology, an outward facing, this is for the whole world. How do we keep it outward facing? Multicultural, it's for every generation, it's for every nation, it's for every tribe, it's for every tongue, it's for every color. Multiplying, it's just not my four and no more. We're not gonna hunker down and wait for Jesus to come and rescue us from this sin-filled world. I don't know how in the world Christians got all wound up on that, but you don't find that on the lips of Jesus. It is an outward facing, multicultural, multiplying movement. 3,000 people in a city that isn't, we, don't, as we think of big cities, it wasn't a big city like we think about big cities. 3,000 people was a significant percentage of the population. And these people were then gonna go back to their regions of the world. God brought the world to Jerusalem that day for this message. 14 language groups, this was unimaginable. Now I know not everybody likes a big church, I get this, but I'm telling you, day one was huge. And as Jesus predicted, this is so important, as Jesus predicted, central to his new movement, his ecclesia, was this one simple idea, that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. The thing that held it all together, the glue, the epicenter, the centrality, the thing that can never be tweaked or changed is that he is the Messiah, the King, the son of the living God. And this new movement was anchored to one indisputable event, his resurrection. Which brings us back to us. So what? 
Now what? Here's what. Repent. 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 You, me, repent. Acknowledge Jesus as your king. Acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and submit to his lordship. And then be baptized. You need to be baptized because baptism is how we publicly acknowledge that we're part of the movement of Jesus. Baptism is how we publicly acknowledge that we're in, that we have decided publicly to follow Jesus for the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of your sins. And I don't know your name and I don't know your story, but I know you're a sinner. And here's how I know that because you've hurt somebody. You've hurt somebody that God loves, which means you've offended God. If you hurt my children, you don't just make it up with my children. You gotta talk to me. Not only have you offended people and hurt people that God loves, you've hurt yourself who God loves. You, you have a debt that you can't pay that you owe other people but you have a debt that you can't pay to your heavenly father because the only way to make it right is to go back in time and undo what you've done and you can't do that, which means you're stuck and I'm stuck and we're stuck and the world was stuck. And then Jesus came and paid the debt that you cannot pay. And the invitation that day and this day is to accept that gift, the gift of forgiveness. And when you accept the gift of forgiveness, you will also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will empower you to live the life that God has invited you to live. And if you're ready, if you're ready, if you're ready, he's ready. So what I wanna do, just as Peter invited that initial group, that original group to respond immediately, I'm inviting you today, whether you're watching online, whether you're at one of our churches, whether you're sitting by yourself or driving somewhere and you're just listening, I wanna invite you today to do exactly what it says. I want you to repent. I want you to change your mind about where you stand with God and who you think Jesus is. And I want you to decide to publicly, publicly align with the ecclesia of Jesus to live this out in such a way that people understand what the church is and who the church is that you'll accept forgiveness for your sins and acknowledge that you need forgiveness. And when you do, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will empower you to live the life that you have been invited to live. So here's what we're gonna do. In just 15 seconds, I'm gonna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and I'm gonna lead you into prayer. And if this is your day, I want you to pray it out loud and I'm gonna make it easy for you. I want all the Christians here to pray out loud as well. Because I want those of you where you're thinking, you know what, I've been thinking about it, I've been considering it, or maybe while I'm preaching, it's like there's something on the inside of you just kind of lit up, that wouldn't be, I am not that good. That is the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to respond today. And if you do, God will fulfill this promise to you because it is for all people. So if you would, Bow with me, all of our campuses, wherever you are, if you're sitting on the couch with somebody at home, everybody together, would you just pray out loud with me? Say, Heavenly Father, no more running, no more resisting. I'm yours. I'm placing my faith in Christ's death on the cross as payment for my sin. If you lead, I'll follow. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life, beginning now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'd love to pray for all of us. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that it's for everybody. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin I know Paul said he was the chief among sinners, but I, my whole life, I've known better. And at times I don't do better. And you've forgiven me anyway, thank you. So Father, for the men and women, the student, whoever it is that maybe this was the first time it clicked for them, would you give them the courage to follow through? And I pray that you would light them up on the inside, that you would pierce their heart like you did in those early days. And that this would be the beginning of a new life in Christ. And we pray all of that in the matchless name of our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Amen. Would you guys just stand with us as we celebrate this and all the people who have decided to follow Jesus?
uh, prayed that prayer with us and Andy at the end and, and you in your own words and following along with him were like, today is the day. Christ is enough for me. We would love to celebrate that with you. So it, it's not a secret to be kept. So please share that with a family member, a friend, if you're here with other people or somebody in a yellow shirt. And more than that, if, if you would like to take the step to maybe be a part of starting point you've got questions that you want answered you want instant community jeremy and jackie who you've heard from earlier have been a part of that um, we've got a new round of starting point that's going to be kicking off shortly or if you want to take the step to publicly profess your faith in baptism we'd love to help you do that you can find out more about both of those steps by just going to our website or app and just look for the starting point graphic there it is or the baptism graphic that's the one with water all right and uh just let us know and we we would seriously we would love that's what this church is about we are so for you we want to help you take those steps as you continue to grow in your relationship with Jesus and maybe you just even want something simpler you've been attending for a while and you want to find out more about the church we have an event coming up here in March um, called connect it's an hour after our second service we'll serve you lunch we'll keep your kids for an extra hour and give them some pizza as well all you need to do is register it's completely free um, and just let us know what sandwich you want and we'd look forward to just meeting you around tables and helping you take your next step as well. So plenty of steps there for each and every one of you. The most important thing is that we keep following in the way of Jesus and walking on. So take the next best step that's appropriate for you. Next Sunday, great Sunday to invite that friend to come and sit with you as we continue the series. Until then, stay connected with us on social media. These baptism videos will be there this afternoon if you want to see them and share them with friends. And uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Go in peace. Thanks for joining us.